what starts it. I kind of want to go, I know I've covered some of this in before, and I think they deserve a little more thorough uh, examination. Because I just have to be a subject I like. So, uh, that's how historians are. We write what we want to. Uh, the big joke used to be uh, there was a German historian at the end of the 19th century. His name was Rank, R E N K. And uh, his view was we could someday have 100% universal history. It would all be done. He said nothing else, nothing else could be added to it. And then people said, well, how is that possible? Since you gather all the facts. Gather all the facts, and you put them all together, and you let the little bastards speak for themselves. And that's history. And somebody came along and said, Don't you know, Professor Rank, that you choose the facts, or you're the one who rejects certain facts, to choose other facts, and so forth, that the, the, human, the human personality gets involved in the creation of history, uh, and this is as much interpretive part of the historian is it is the facts themselves because the facts never speak for themselves unless you put them in there to do the speaking. You choose it. You're, you're the chooser. You're the selector. So very, very important. Uh, first historian that ever wrote, Herodotus, great guy. He put in everything with the kitchen sink in his history, including, I think, some of his own inventions. A lot of stuff in there. And his successor, who hated him. Historians are like that, they hate each other. Uh, his successor was Thucydides, uh, who was just the opposite. He detailed all of his facts and he said, you know, you can't have, you can't throw in everything. And the result was that you know, Thucydides' history, which is about the Peloponnesian War, it's Greek against the Greeks, destroys Greek civilization, as it turns out, uh, is one of the worst histories ever. It's the most boring thing you've ever written. Whereas, Herodotus, who just indiscriminately choosing whatever, uh, made a great, this, this, it's fun stuff. You read Herodotus, it's fun. You know it can't be true, but it's fun. Okay. Now we're going to look at the American Revolution from the point of view of somewhat how the British look at it and somewhat how the Americans look at it. We each have a different point of view. And uh, that being said, Start off here and stay somewhat close to the notes and just talk about something. On the eve of the American Revolution, you have, first of all, what is what is the problem with the British system? How could a sophisticated system like this stumble into a war of independence against their own colonies? Yeah. Because they were adding injury to insult by stopping the Americans from moving west when they That's part of it? Felt that it was their right. right to. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some. I'm going to talk about the political divisions in England, and I'm going to get. Then I'll get back to this. Yeah. Uh, the colonies felt they were underrepresented in the parliament. And severely. Uh, one representative, of the entire 13 colonies covering 3 million people. The policy of salutary neglect. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. 156 years, and we didn't need you, stinky bastards. Now you're coming to tell us we need you. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a little late. We don't need the we don't need the advice. Thank you. Okay, so these are all issues. Itemizing a little bit here. Uh, first of all, you have this question of the representation in Parliament that is corrupted by something called the Rotten Borough System. R O T T Rotten R O T T E N. Borough, B-O-R-O-U-G-H, Rotten Borough System. Now this is a very, what they're talking about is the voting precincts, what today they call them boroughs. The voting precincts had been set up when England had gone through its last rebel revolution itself back in 1688. <coughs> Based on the philosophy of John Locke, natural, we talk about natural law and so forth. Certain people in certain areas of the country were given the right to vote. The result was not exactly what I would call universal suffrage, 
but those who voted for Parliament consisted of one, one person out of every 350. Now that's not exactly what I would call a, a win for democracy. But it is a win because there wasn't any kind of democracy anywhere else. This is the first time it had been practiced, as far as we know, since, since the Athenians did it in ancient Greece. Nobody had done it. So one in 350. <coughs> so this was just allowed to continue at that level. Then came the American, then came the Industrial Revolution. It hit England in the 1750s, probably earlier than that. And what you had affecting those districts or boroughs where the, where the votes were taking place, you had whole populations move to the new industrial centers where they can get work. People need to work. And so they were moving to cities that did not really exist before, creating those cities like Manchester, Leeds. I mean, they were around, but they were a small town. Now they're loaded with hundreds of thousands of people. London grew additionally. Uh, up in Scotland, you have areas like Aberdeen, which grew. Glasgow in the west that grew. So you have these industrial centers with involving 50 to 100,000 people each moving in, and none of them are designated as voting districts. The people there have have no voice, no vote. What did have a voice and voted were the areas that were largely deserted now. Areas that in fact had even gone underwater because of the rise of sea levels in the English Channel. Little places like East and West Loo, I know you've heard of it, it's one of your favorite places to go visit. Spell L-O-O. -O. Uh, simply went underwater, but they still had a vote. So you had a number of these, these really wacky inconsistencies. Therefore, in terms of the proportion of, of votes going to support members of parliament who would in turn vote for the support of the king or against the king, you had virtually uh, a total disconnected population. They, areas that should not have a vote were voting, and areas that, had, that needed to have a vote had no vote whatsoever. That also included the 13 colonies that only had one representation. In other words, this was not the system was, things had shifted and the system didn't, no longer really function. That's what's called the rotten borough system. And the English are very slow to change things. They weren't about to change the rotten boroughs. <coughs> Question. So when you say that the certain areas had a vote, um, does it mean like certain landowners who own those areas? Pretty much, but they still get a vote, and the vote's, the vote's there. But areas where you have, some of these landowners have moved, some have become now major holders, no longer in land, but major holders in corporations that are producing coal, in particular, and later iron ore. Uh, or developing mills for wool, the woolen industry. They got Manchester, Leeds, uh, Sheffield, parts of London, Glasgow, Aberdeen, almost all without representation of any kind. So the population is not really represented. Okay, but there is voting going on, but the voting counts for these ancient districts that no longer are even above water. Seriously, some of them. Okay, it's part of it. It's a serious issue, let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. So you said that the 13 colonies, three million people at this point. It's, that sounds pretty big like for one, area, one concentrated area. Like would London have a larger population or was there, I guess, what I'm asking is like, what were the other yeah, yeah, makeups of the so the most of the cities are, are, you know, the cities that are not, we're not talking about modern city structure in terms of millions, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. All oh, right. And that London was still, by this time, the biggest. The other ones were not much a century earlier. They were very small uh, populations. But now they had really grown enormously. They were building housing for the workers. 
uh, what they call row housing, people who live in these things, we'll talk about that too. But not at this juncture, but the, the living conditions were pretty poor uh, for people living in these areas. <coughs> Uh, but basically, it's just not a, you have a parliament that is there based on the vote of something that's so slender, uh, almost not, almost to be non-existent. And the problem is the English really don't care that much about it. They don't, I mean, as long as it's nothing affected by it, they don't, they're not bothered by it. Particularly. Slow to change unless something shakes it up. This is going to shake it up. But... Um, in regards to this, it probably would not have been a serious issue had it not been the fact that in 1760, you have a new king come to power, and it's George III. You have the two Georges came and just simply did the bidding of Parliament. They were what? They, they, they reigned, but they never ruled. They didn't care to rule. I'm getting paid for a job. I don't have to do anything. It's the kind of job everybody wants. You don't have to do anything. Become a teacher in college. You want that kind of a job? It's great. All you have to do, manage, is to get up. <coughs> and then you're on your way. You know, fame and fortune. Yeah, right. Okay, anyway. That conflicts with a few deans and provosts and presidents and, and all the other kind of bullshit that goes on here. Uh, Jonathan, how is your dad taking all this stuff on campus? Is he too aware? Huh? I'm not too aware of that. Does he talk about it? Uh, not recently. Okay, not recently. Somebody got to him, we'll shut him up. <laughs> <laughs> no, his father's a professor of philosophy here. So that's great. Um, that's why he always gets an A from me. <laughs> he knows better. He doesn't always ask. Okay, so. Um, George III, to make a bad situation worse, George III comes in 1760. He comes to rule and not just to reign. Okay, how do you pull that off? He's the wrong man for the wrong time, I'll tell you right now. Parliament at the time of George III was never so corrupt Never, ever like this. There was an outstanding first minister, prime minister, that told George III to go stick it. You're not going to get away with it. But that prime minister had gotten old and he got tired and he got grumpy and he lost his tenure. But he got grumpy and his name was William Pitt the Elder. Very famous political family in England. He's got a son who's going to follow him, same way. Very bright, uh, very much on the attack against the king and so forth. William Pitt the Elder, however, was too old to really defy the king now, and he's outnumbered in Parliament. What's, what are we talking about? William Pitt the Elder is the, is the leader of the Whig opposition, the Whig opposition. Who are the Whigs? What do they represent? Parliament, which is uh, power. Yeah, and what about Parliament in, in regards to the king? They support the king's prerogatives or they support uh, their own checks and, <coughs> huh? checks and balances. Checks and balances, tell the king to back off. We're not going to support his, his, uh, his notions. Uh, we're not going to support the financial request that he's made. Uh, we're going to tell him when he's abusing power. That's the Whigs. The Whigs are the great liberals of the 19th, of the 18th century and part of the 19th. The Tories are in opposition. They're going to support the king. They're going to support George. If George wants to fight a war or if George wants to enforce the navigation laws, which subjects all of the American colonies to very strict controls on trade, trade has to be on British ships and has to be to Britain only. If the Tories support that idea and the Whigs don't, then you have a battle on your hands. 
But what if the Whigs decide to get on board? What would, what would, what would encourage them to get on board? Money. The money. Follow the money. And the money it was. What they're going to do, what the king is going to do, with the help of many in Parliament, are offer these groovy jobs to these Whig dissidents, guys that oppose the king, offer them, hey, you know, you're a really good guy. You know, keep your politics. You know, fight the king. Do all you want. That's, that's cool. Because you, you're entitled to do that. You're, you're a Whig schmuck. We know that. But just, it's all right. But you stay, at least you stand for something. Therefore, the king, by the way, had a little job for you. Uh, 50,000 50, pounds a year to be made as customs coordinator in Jamaica. What's the normal salary of a Whig politician at the time? Nothing. Well, they got, they did get money through various little things, but it wasn't salary money. They'd stand for Parliament. They had to support themselves. Uh, they had estates. They had money coming in from that. But also, they were, get, you know, the average wage for the average worker in at that time was about thirty pounds a year. This guy's getting, let's say, 50,000 pounds as director of customs in Jamaica for doing what? Going there if he wanted to. He didn't have to go there. I'd go there. I mean, shit, it's Jamaica. It's gorgeous. Islands, breeze, Caribbean. Let me check my ticket right now. Do that. Or you get these groovy jobs as an ambassador. You're, a, you're, you're an associate to the ambassador of the court of the Ottoman Empire. Pays 10,000 pounds. You don't have to speak a word, word of Turkish, and you don't even have to go there. You just get the title, and you get the money. Are you going to vote for this king's policies when they come around? Shit, yes. Are you a Whig liberal? Yeah. Are you corrupt? No. Well, we seem to we have a little evidence here of conflict of interest, not me. Never. Nobody ever has conflict of interest. Okay. Except Trevor. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious, at this time, was there like, did the Whigs kind of represent uh, free trade while the Tories represented more of the mercantile system? There's a difference there. Yeah, there's much more free trade, but free trade isn't always free, as you know. Uh, free trade as long as England has the, has the balance of power. But yeah, uh, navigation laws are the, are the outgrowth of the old, of the older mercantile system, which was tied to the concept of bullionism. The more wealth you had, the better off you were as a, as a power. And therefore, we keep it. We, we don't give it out. We keep it. And we take more in all the time. The more wealth we have, the greater the power. There's only so much wealth in the world. I mean, that's the view. This is the four Fs that came along. Um, so there's a, there's a real struggle along that line. But, but, you know, essentially, you have half this parliament that's been bought off by the king. The king had the money to do it. How did the kings ever get the money to do this? They got it because they had been behaving themselves between George I and George II. They accumulated a lot of, a lot of money, property, titles, defunct inheritances, and so forth. Therefore, they had a lot, quite a lot. Uh, they didn't have to do anything, they didn't spend anything, and now by the time the revolution is blooming, 1760 up to 1775, you've got, what, 15 years in which there's resentment building, but these guys are now using their most effective weapon of buying off the politicians. So there's no genuine opposition in the British Parliament to speak of that's going to oppose this king's policy. In other words, what, what normally should have happened is the Whigs should have been yelling their heads off at this king and his attitude toward the colonies, towards enforcing the navigation laws, towards enforcing collection of forced collection of taxation, all those things which the Americans never had to deal with. Most of the British politicians would have argued in favor of colonial rights. But at this point, they didn't because the king had bought most of them off. Those who would really be there to oppose 
were not in a position to do so because it impacted their own wealth by this time. Now, how many people were talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of parliaments? Cushy jobs, all kinds of stuff. But then you had the question of what went who has the authority to deal with the American colonies? The king or the parliament or who? Who has is there any one authority in Britain? that can negotiate with the Americans and tell them this is our policy, this is what we should do, and this is your responsibility for us. Is there any group or one man or collection of people that have the right to do this? And the issue is unbelievably, but not really, because it's the British. No. There was no one agency that dealt with the colonies. They're all mixed. And they have colliding interests. They have very vested assets in these colonies. They don't agree with each other. Their jurisdictions overlap. And what we're talking, we're talking about first of all the Navy Department. The Navy Department in, in Britain, known as the Lord at the Admiralty, was also very much uh, in charge of commerce, colonial commerce. They enforced the navigation laws. But opposed to them was the colonial office, which had some kind of jurisdiction over the colonies, but nobody knew quite what, except the colonial office should have jurisdiction over colonies. And then you had the southern department. Now, nobody really knows what that even means, except it was in the, it, it was it definitely held the interest of the army or the military. Then you had the parliament itself, which had one representative representing the colonies. And then you had the king himself, who sort of was above it all, but claimed absolute authority over the colonies. In other words, sometimes we all in life get, in, get involved in a jam. And you're trying to figure out who the hell am I dealing with? Who do I deal with? Who's responsible for handling my problem? I don't know if you ever had that happen, but, but it happens often. And you're out here, you're going, well, yeah, my parents can't deal with this because they're not really involved. I remember, well, I have to tell you a story. Okay, sure, I got a story for all occasions. I'm old enough, I can do that. <laughs> I owned a condo on Tolton Creek, which I sold this last year, a little condo. And about six years ago, I had rented out this condo, and I did, I that is the, the uh, rentor was going to be, lady. She had a cat, and I said, okay, I'll let the cat in. Where's your cat? But I, I'll put up with the cat. Turns out, she wound up on Craigslist, and she was a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> I got complaints from the neighbors called and said, something's going on here. And I went over to see what's going on. There was like a freaking lineup outside my condo. <laughs> <laughs> well, now what do I do? So I turned to the Ashland PD. I said, you know, I, it's obvious something's going on. She never wrote the check. She always paid me in cash. <laughs> <laughs> it was a freaking, I look back, it was a hoot. It made, the, it made the, the headlines, the Ashland Daily, Daily Tidings, you know. Uh, prostitution ring on Tolman Creek. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the horrible thing was I wasn't making a penny out of it. <laughs> I made nothing for this thing. <laughs> I, went, I went to Ashland PD and they, they wouldn't handle it. But they, they busted her for some reason. And, I, and she called me. It's before I really quite put it all together. And he says, well, I'm in front of the Ashland Police Station. Can you please come get me? <coughs> what are you doing? You're not that far from where you live. Yeah, I know where you live, obviously. So I went drove down to get her, and she, she was giving me the song. And I still didn't know what the hell was going on. And then they called me later and said we had, we had her arrested for prostitution. I said, well, why didn't you keep her? You know, I mean, you, what, what, are, what exactly are you doing? What's your role here? And I went to them, and I said, I want to, I have to write out a complaint because I thought it would be a negative eviction. I can't have, can't have this going on the property. And uh, I said, you know, I don't like coming down here. And the cop that I talked to said, well, apparently, it was his. 
I said something that I typically would never say to a cop in LA. <laughs> I, was, I was really enraged. I mean, typically, and I'm not anti police, man, but these guys were so, this was so, such an unwarranted, arrogant, stupid comment. Apparently, you do. Okay. No, I don't. You know. So, it, as it turns out, they couldn't do anything anyway. And I tried to well, who can do something? It's out of their jurisdiction. I said, it's international. Everything's outside of your jurisdiction except DUIs. You know, that seems to be your major thing, right? <laughs> but knowing that I would, you know, and I know a couple of guys on the force that have been like former students and stuff, and I like them, they're great guys. But the department as a whole sucks. That's all I can say about that. Anyway, so um, if anybody here is related to anybody on the PD, I don't want to offend you, but this is my senior year, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to wind up going to Jackson County Sheriff. And yeah, they can write. They'll take care of the whole thing. You know, that's their jurisdiction. They'll handle that. Turn it over to the judge. The judge called the trial in about three weeks, and bang, 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 it was over. But I had more trouble driving around trying to figure out who handles this and that kind of stuff because no one would take take. It. The reason I get pissed off at that particular case because when I was a, I was in law enforcement in L.A. I was a probation officer, L.A. County probation officer, and I remember thinking. You know, this is podunk up here. You know, they treat they treat this city like it's New York City, but it's really Mayberry RFD. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and half the police believe it's New York, and the other half believe it's Mayberry. So you never know who you're dealing with. So that's what I'm talking about. You didn't know who you were dealing with here, as they call the colonials. Colonials are trying to figure out well, who do we talk to about the navigation laws. And then suddenly you've got you've got the French and Indian War, what, right in the middle of the death of George II and George III comes in. Toward the end of that war, that war ends in 1762. And then they draw a line. Why did Americans fight in that war? Was this war in our interest? And some did the did fighting alongside the British do anything for us? Was there something in it for us? And the British said, yeah, of course, fighting for your, we're fighting for your defense. We're fighting to keep you safe from the French and from uh, the Five Nations and the Iroquois that have aligned themselves uh, with the French at that time. So ultimately, the Five Nations switched over and joined the British. So the British response to this is, well, you know, this is a very costly war. Cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to fight this. A lot of our guys were killed. A lot of our, some of our ships were sank. This is a tough war. It was a tough war. It was fought all over the globe, not just in the Americas. So at the end of the day, when uh, those Highland troops went up to the plains of Abraham in Quebec, General Wolfe was killed. General Montcalm was captured, the French general. We took Quebec, Montreal. To Lewisburg and everything else, and suddenly we had a glorious victory. A lot of the troops used in the reconquest of Quebec, Montreal, and in Lewisburg were American militia. Why? What was our interest in fighting this war? Well, what started the war in the first place? The whole question of real estate. No, uh, just territorial expansion. Yeah, our expansion into the Western territories, into the Ohio Valley. Uh, we wanted to do that, uh, and the French were there blocking. Indian allies were there naturally blocking. They don't want the Americans coming in, screwing everything up. We under, I mean, all that, those issues aside, we understand that. But to the Americans, this is a war for real estate. This is a war <coughs> for territorial expansion. At the end of the day, when the treaty is signed, that ends this war, the British decide, well, since we fought the war on behalf of the Americans, they need to pay some of the bills. Well, I agree, we did. We needed to pay some of the bills. But what they what they did was add insult to injury by saying, by the way, you're going to pay for the bills, you're going to pay for some 10,000 troops that are going to be stationed along that whole barrier of the Allegheny-Appalachian line that runs parallel to the East Coast 
about 150 miles inland. And throughout that line, we're going to station British troops to make sure Americans don't move westward of that line. And the American position was, well, wait, wait, a, wait just a minute here. What have we been fighting the last seven years for? To be, to, for westward expansion. And the British said, no, you pray not. You're not going to cross that line. And by the way, you're going to pay for those troops to be there and make sure you can't cross the line. Are you kidding me? You mean we can't cross the line and we got to pay for the soldiers that guard the line? It's like paying for your freaking jailer. No, we're not going to do it. And the British said, yes, you are going to do it. So after we said no about 10 times, the British found a way around it, fine. We'll simply tax you directly. We have never been taxed directly by anybody, never. So you start <laughs> off with, yeah. Well, I, I was just wondering, why did the British take the side of the Native Americans instead of their own colonials? Because their colonials had been fighting for them for a oh. while. And but, so, but so had the Native Americans, especially the, the Iroquois, had left the French and gone to the British side, and that, that really guarded that part of the frontier, and they took a lot of heat for it. Uh, took a lot of warfare. So this, these alliances, we tend to we tend to look at this sort of thing in a very vague way. Oh yeah, the, the French and Indian War. The role of the Indians in the war was very significant uh, in terms of their casualties, in terms of maintaining territories that the British said they wanted to keep, vital strategic territories, and especially in keeping the French out of any further acquisition of territory uh, below the St. Lawrence Seaway. You really have a lot of very vital interests that the Native Americans provided for us, especially the Iroquois. Uh, so that becomes, the British feel an obligation to support the Iroquois. Uh, it's something that the Americans probably never, ever felt for Native American tribes on any level. I mean, you know, we may agree with them, they may support us, and then we screw over them. We call it within the generation, at least. Questions, comments? Oh, uh, I, this is more of a branch in a different direction, but uh, we talked about how people in the British Department were elected. How were people elected in the uh, colonial legislatures? Uh, depends on how the colony was originally set up. Predatory <laughs> colony, uh, where you have more of a royal governor appointment. Uh, appointment by Parliament or appointment by the King, or you are the result of elections, such as the Massachusetts Bay Colony. No royal appointment necessary. You have a royal approval of electoral appointment. Uh, so it, it varied, uh, but typically taxation was never done without uh, the colonial assemblies actually having to approve that tax, uh, and it never came down. It never came from London. It always came. Colonial Assembly itself voted to tax itself to pay for certain repairs, pay for harbors, pay for libraries, pay for road buildings, and any any excessive money that would go back to the British for any specific kind of reason, they would pay for that too, based on their vote. It would never be a direct tax coming from London or from Westminster or anywhere else. So everybody's has everybody's got a little deal here. It's it's um, So the suggestion that we can just tax these people, uh, it sounds like really naive when you start talking. Taxation without representation. Is that weak? What does that mean? Well, what it means, it's never happened. And the British are trying to have an end run here around what was had become a very sacrosanct tradition that only the colonial legislatures tax themselves. Most colonial legislatures were there by vote of the people. Uh, you had pretty much male suffrage, uh, but it had to be over the age of 20 or 21, depending on the colony, some over 18. Uh, typically, women were not part of the voting effort. Uh, some states or some colonies had property qualifications, others didn't. So it kind of depended on, on each, each state's a little bit different. Okay. Um, so each one has a different background, a little, a little different view. 
okay, along comes this effort at taxation. It began in 1764 with, with the sugar tax. Followed immediately by in 65 with the stamp tax. Sugar tax was, I mean, everybody used sugar. And, you know, you had sugar producers all over the globe by this time. Uh, the Caribbean was the highest sugar producer. A lot of it, a lot of these producers were British colonies. Sugar was being overproduced, so if you could get something on it like a tax, it would be just wonderful. So sugar becomes it's a commodity everybody used because by this time everybody is drinking tea or coffee. This is new stuff that's just come on the market. It's new on the market for the last 50 years. Where did it come from? The tea came from China, the coffee came from the Arabian Peninsula. And I told you about the location of the Arabian Peninsula, the place called Bayat el Bukhet. And the British wrote down when they got there, so we got to, they got to where was it? near Jeddah, and then they took a camel caravan inland using Arab guides, probably Saudi guides. You've always been there. We know you, you're not, you came from the Middle East though. Anyway, uh, and the British said, they wrote down, by a bouquet, that's what in the translation, but the British couldn't pronounce it. We, we came to die to be buddy. <laughs> B-double-E-T-L-E-F-U-C-K-E-E. -E -E. It is a, I fell on my face laughing at the India office when I found this manuscript and where the British discovered coffee and how they tried to get all these coffee bushes. That was the green, that was the green coffee. They fell because they didn't have any other, the, the coffee is later, people are going to steal the bushes if they can and transplant it all over the Caribbean or down to Brazil. But they have, they've got to steal this stuff. But it wasn't universal, but it's spreading. People, and the British are bringing in coffee, and they're bringing in tea. It's one of the big commodities from the East India Company, is the tea. So they're bringing this stuff in, and they put a tax on the sugar, because you don't want to, a lot of this, British tastes were not such, that, and American tastes were not such, that people drank this stuff black. They drank it with, Sometimes cream and sugar, both. And they like it. It's a lot better than what they were. It would be, it changed everything. Coffee houses opened all over the continent. You had coffee and tea houses open up in Britain. You had everybody buying services for tea and coffee. This became a big market for China. China where originally is the tea and coffee services that you, that you use to serve coffee and tea. Ceramic ware, China ware. That's why it's called China. So this was this was a huge industry. So you put a tax on the sugar because the sugar tax is connected to the coffee and the tea and the China trade all together. Okay. Are people going to pay it? Or can you buy it from the Dutch or from the Spanish? Or even, God forbid, the French, whom we just had a war with. Americans are saying, we'll show you who you can buy it from. And they boycotted English sugar. The result was within it by 1765, the sugar was down to one tenth of the amount of sales that it had been in 1763. So it was a very effective boycott. And this is throughout all colonies. This is all the colonies pretty much doing it. Uh, because they're all, well, they'd rather get, now that proves the point. They would rather pay a higher price for smuggled sugar than a lower price through the tax on it, direct from the British government. In other words, they're fighting here on the question of principle, of, and I'm sure a lot of them didn't understand that. So the political leadership made sure they understood it by giving speeches, you, you, buy, you buy sugar from the British, you buy their crappy rotten sugar, you're supporting their taxation efforts. You pay a higher price for sugar, but you're, gonna, but you're independent. 
get her from the Dutch, get her from the French, get her from the Spanish, but buy from them, and you're securing your independence from British abuse. So the propagandists are already starting up early in this, in this conflict. And then comes the stamp tax. That's on every document that you need in the colonies for marriage, for burial, for real estate transactions, no matter what it is, for land purchases, you need to have a legal, the legal mechanism is a stamp. It says, I, I legally did this transaction. It's like the stamp of approval from a lawyer. It costs money. It's a small, very small. Doesn't matter. So we did, in fact, begin to boycott anybody that was selling the stamps. We boycotted the sugar. And pretty soon you've got a lot of hotheads on your hands. And to enforce these and attacks on British tax collectors, by 1770, you have what are called the Coercive Acts. The Coercive Acts are now attempts to make these taxes work by armed force. And the British sent two regiments into Boston. They go into Boston, and they're going to be forced to be housed in the apartments of many of the, of the citizens of Boston against their will. There is some small payment made to those that house British troops. But the insult of having a British, British troops in your home is not worth it to many, many of the colonials. We don't want these people here. The second problem is an unrelated problem totally to it, but it comes out to be a big issue. A lot of these guys are trained workers, they're skilled workers. They're blacksmiths. They are rope makers. They're shipbuilders. They're wheelwrights. They're all kinds of skills, but they're in the Navy. So they look while they're in the Navy and they're on land in Boston, they got nothing to do. So they go out and look for jobs and they get hired as skilled workers. So now they're re they're, they are replacing American workers. It's an issue that rarely ever came up in terms of other colonies. But it sure came up in Boston. However, you have soldiers in town in crowded conditions. It's, let, it's going to lead to confrontation. <clears throat> 1770, the confrontation hits the Boston Massacre. These guys were so hated. They were hated by a lot of the people whose jobs had been lost to these British sailors and soldiers who had taken American jobs. Now, I, you know what? You know how this works. Guy has skill. He's got skilled labor, and he's going to work for less than you do, and he's going to do twice as much. Of course, the business owner is going to hire him and fire you. That happens all the time. And these Brits were counting on it. It's extra money to, to send home to their families. They're not anti-American or anything else. They're not even political. But on the streets of Boston, they get surrounded. And they're attacked by a couple of mobs. And Americans are not discriminate about how they do this. They, it's not simple snowballs. These are hunks of ice with glass and rocks inside. They hit these guys. They injure a couple of them very badly. They surround them. They look like they're going to attack, kill them. And uh, these redcoats pull out their guns and open fire. They're scared. They are scared shitless. You ever been in a mob? Ever been in a mob riot? Anybody? Ever seen one? I'll never forget when I was down in LA for the Rodney King riots. When I was, I was down there to do a paper. And I survived the, the Watts riots. And then after that, for Years, I was a probation officer in LA and all this, was going, this shit was going on constantly. You never knew when you were going to have a riot on your hands. So I worked at a major juvenile facility down there working with gangs and they had a riot. I remember it so well. I mean, it probably lasted two or three hours. And we were out there wrestling and all kinds of shit, trying to keep ourselves from getting killed uh, until we had a full force that, that, that handled it. Riots are very scary. 
You don't know if you're going to make it. I have guys that really got good buddies of mine that got pretty well beat up on those damn things. So you're tense. You open fire. You kill five people. And that's what the British did. This probably would not have been a big time event because nobody would have known about it, except by this time, the Americans had decided to take things a bit further. Not being just anti-tax, they decide, you know what? We've got to shit. We've got to, we've got to develop a propaganda system to get pe get people to wake up and take a stand against the British. We want out of out from under British rule. Now that's a very select group that felt that way, and they organized politically all up and down the colonies, and they were called the committees of correspondence. Today you don't need that. Today you got cell phones, you got Twitter, you got. Twitter has its own language. It's like when somebody asks me, do you woo? Fuck you, I don't woo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to I, I do enough work. I don't need to moodle. You moodle. I don't want to. You don't put things out on the phone. Nor am I ever going to. <laughs> Just ask me. So it's such a flare-up. Samuel Adams. One of the founding fathers, later, comes to the rescue of the British soldiers that are on trial. They're going on trial in Boston for murder, for homicide. Samuel Adams defends them. Yeah. Who? John Adams? Sam. Brother. Uh, Samuel Adams defends them? Huh? John Adams. I thought it was John Adams. Well, there's two. There's John Adams, uh, like third president of the United States, and then there's Samuel Adams. He's the beer guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's the beer bear. Yeah, they're really. Uh, you might be right, John. Yeah, I think it was John. Yeah, no, you're right. You are right. You are right. I, I've had a little too much Sam Adams in my life. <laughs> they're brothers. They're both revolutionary. And uh, they defend. They're gonna, he's going to defend as well. And it turns out he gets acquittals on all, all of them. The strange thing is he is part, he's a member of the Sons of Liberty, which is an anti-British propaganda outfit as well. So it's a very interesting thing. He believes, however, that the trial should be fair. And these Brits probably were not necessarily to blame for the hostile American audience, hostile atmosphere. And the greater British government is to blame, not these guys. You also had the martyrdom in that uh, five man that were killed there, uh, the first African American uh, killed in the beginning, of, toward the beginning of the revolution, uh, Crispus Atticus. Uh, and so this is quite a stirring event. Following this, uh, the British now launched the coercive acts to enforce the law in the colonies again. Okay, ultimately you're going to have a number of these attempts. The British never, they never back off on their belief that they have the right, in principle, to directly tax the colonies. That's the bottom line. Ultimately, we get to 1775. We have more of these attempted taxations. None of them go over. Pretty much all a failure. Because the Americans continue the boycott. But at the same time, you've got a division in the American public about what to do. And you need to know it's a very simple formula, the three things. One group of Americans, one third of the Americans said, we need, we need, a, we need a break from British. The other third said, no, we, we need to stay with Britain. And the other third said, we don't care. We don't know. And so what the two groups, the committees of correspondence, and the Sons of Liberty do, they are, they are attempting to radicalize the American population into fighting a war of independence against the British, declaring independence. In other words, they are out to radicalize whoever they can get to join with them. And they are somewhat successful but in the end, what was the one lone document that came, comes out of the blue that radicalizes more Americans than anything else? 
Common sense. Common sense. Who wrote it? Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, common sense. Out it comes, and it, it just it just wins over a lot of the population. So now it's about two thirds to one third for independence. It's still a risky business. We want to know if we're going to have allies. The British then reoccupy Boston after the Boston Tea Party. They send troops into Charleston, South Carolina. After Charleston, the rebels burnt some 10 British ships in Charleston Harbor. In Boston, they only threw the, the tea chest over. So you have one destruction on both sides. It's getting out of hand. Everybody's tense. Nobody knows how to solve it. And the problem, the, the thing is, in, on the British side, there is a paralysis in the British government to deal with this. Why? Because the Whigs' opposition to the king and to these policies is all what? Bought off. It's all bought up. It's gone its very way. They can't, they can't organize against it. They're powerless. Uh, what is uh, William Pitt the Younger doing at this time? William Pitt the Younger is really not much in the political limelight. You know, he's, he's still, he is very young. And he's going to, when he does come of age, he's going to be the youngest member of Parliament, but it's not going to be until oh. we get to the period of the French Revolution, 1789. It's a lot later. He's, he's very young at this point. But the old man's very old. That's the problem. And the old man dies early during the American Revolution, and therefore he cannot organize anything against it. He can't organize the British in opposition. Okay? Uh, so the opposition is strong. You bought them off. Uh, <coughs> you can't, nothing, nothing can go anywhere here at a certain point. Now, you've got these coercive acts still in effect. They reoccupied Boston, they occupied Charleston. And they send the militia, they send, by the way, the regiments in Boston to illegally seize all of the gunpowder and all the guns at the munitions depot at Concord. At like, on the way to Lexington, this is April the 19th, on April the 19th, 1775, a year before the Declaration of Independence. The fighting starts. As these regiments encounter, there's a total of 4,700 British troops. Total. As they go through Lexington, they have a skirmish, they kill a number of, a number of young fighters. Word spreads, they get to Concord, they seize the weapons depot, they set it on fire, and as they begin to leave, they are fired upon because the Minutemen have shown up. You've got these guys lined up from Concord all the way back to Boston. Concord to Lexington, through Arlington, which was called Monotony at the time, all the way back to Boston, behind trees and hedgerows and rock rows, and they're opening point blank range on the British, killing hundreds of British troops out of 4,700. Hundreds more are wounded as they get back to Boston. And now it's a bloody fight. It's, 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 this is known as Patriot's Day, 1775, April 19th. No war has been declared. The impact of common sense is everywhere, and everybody's supporting what they did in Boston. So you have small flare-ups in New York, small flare-ups in Charleston. People are tense. And ultimately, the First Continental Congress decides we've got to solve this. This is a genuine attempt on the part of Continentals make an offer, a peace offer, to the British government. Let's stop this before it becomes totally insane. Now you've got to remember that these people are most, not entirely, but a lot, most of them are of English heritage, or British heritage. You probably have maybe 25% are from other lineages, French, Spanish, Dutch, without any British connection, but 75% are, are British, British heritage. <clears throat> and they really don't want to fight. 
with the mother country. You also have the same opinion on the part of many of the soldiers that have already been sent from, from Britain to the colonies. They don't want to go to the colonies and fight, as they said, quote unquote, with their own with their own kith and kin. This is not going to be a pleasant experience. So there's really a standoff here, and there's a question of how bad can this get? So the first Continental Congress, which was, by the way, organized in New York City, they sent a the, the petition, it's called the Olive Branch Petition, which I talked about last time, directly to the king. And here is the issue. We don't know who the hell we're supposed to talk, talk to. Is it Parliament? Is it somebody in the cabinet? Northern, the Northern Department, the Southern Department, the Colonial Office, the Navy, the military, who do we talk to? So they sent it to the king. Well, I, we think the king is probably so far removed from these things, he couldn't possibly know what's going on. That the abuses and the atrocities that have taken place, he could not have known this and organized it. it just, so they said, if you knew, we know you would take care of these things. Fine. He sends them a letter back a year late. A year later, dear folks, how can you say you are my loyal subjects if you are killing my royal and loyal troops? Speaking of what happened on Patriots Day, April nineteenth, troops got killed. Colonials took over. The hills around Boston, you have Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill, and they brought artillery from Fort Ticonderoga. They brought it into Breed's Hill and Bunker Hill and began to attack the British forces in Boston. Fine, because the British are attacking them. They're go it's going back and forth. Who started this shit? Well, who do you think started it? Sending troops to Lexington and Concord to seize the weapons depot. That's a hostile fucking act, pardon me. But it is. It's a stupid act. It's as if somehow the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Did you check with Parliament before you decided to make that move? It's a very inflammatory move. No, nobody checked with me. You just did it. One of General Gage's actions. Okay, so now you have. British ships coming in, bringing additional thousands of troops to land on the eastern seaboard of every city. And here King George is saying, well, you know, he sent me an olive branch petition, this is so called, and that you're loyal. And you knew if I knew what was going on, you'd stop it. Well, I do know what's going on, and you've been killing my loyal soldiers, my loyal subjects, and so forth. What he has done here, he's set up a slam freaking dunk. There's no way you can get through. In other words, you, you've lost your argument a priori from the beginning. There is no argument. You fired on my troops. Don't call yourselves loyal. And when they read that, they knew they had had it. They put a lot of confidence in George, and George turns out to be a total jerk. He's a law and order man. But basically, he's a big bullshitter. He knows what's going on. He's part of the problem. But the Americans don't quite understand it. But, try to, but this is one of the basic issues. If you don't know what jurisdiction you're supposed to deal with, you're in trouble. You've got to know who you're dealing with. OK. So once they re realized this, they backed off and said, and they regathered, remet. Philadelphia this time, Second Continental Congress, and at that point they made the Declaration of Independence. They accused George III of violating his contract under natural law, using the philosophy of John <coughs> Locke and the Enlightenment. They accused George of violating some 23 or 4 points under, under this law, under natural law. It was a very explosive proclamation. It's not, I mean, did all colonials agree with this idea? No, they didn't. You still had maybe, what, 25% that didn't agree with this. 
But now the colonials are back to a position where they have no choice. Now they knew in the long run they were going to get Mel Gibson and others to join them in the Patriot. I though I love the movie. It was a lot of fun. It's a total bullshit movie. Part of it. The Americans know they're not going to win this war by themselves. But they also know they have a lot of there's a lot of countries on the continent that can't stand the British. Why? Because the British didn't give back anything after the last war. Remember we talked about that. So the question. Now it comes to bear. Can we bring in, in these powers into the war to support us? In the first place, Britain has the largest navy in the world. We don't have one. We have none. Oh, we've got a few schooners running, you know, smuggling operations, but that's it. We don't have a navy. We're going to build one, but we don't have one. We would love to have the French Navy involved in blockading the British to keep them out of our ports. So the American signers of the Declaration of Independence have already decided they're going to send representatives out immediately to bring in European powers on the side of the, of the Americas to fight the British. And so Ben Franklin is sent to Paris. And he just absolutely whoops it. He loves Paris. He almost forgets his assignment. He loves Paris so much. <laughs> he gets to Paris. He gets in with a party group, with the King's Royal Elite group, all the powdered wigs and all that good stuff. He gets in with them, and he just milks it. He's a man of nature. He wears his fur coat, his fur cap, and all this stuff, and he talks with his courting accent. He just does it deliberately to make him appear. And the French ideal is the man of nature at the time. The person of the wilderness who braves the wilderness. I mean, the French were into this. Now, the French are always into odd things. And Ben Franklin just acted the part. He loved it. And he worked with the king. He worked with, the, with many of the courtiers of the time. Won't you please support the Americans? And a lot of the French were saying, you know, we should get involved because we, the British took a lot from us in the last war. We got nothing back. But, you know, they're not going to be able to beat the British, and we're going to get left holding the bag again. They also appealed to Spain, because Spain had lost Gibraltar to the British way back. But the Spanish aren't going to go in without the French. And then you have the League of Armed Neutrality, Sweden, Prussia, Holland, the League of Armed Neutrality. All had lost things to the British over the years. They're all kind of weighing, well, should we get involved or should we not? Well, finally, when this war started, the fighting started, there were no significant victories on much of either side. And this war went on from 76, 77, nothing much going on, a lot of chasing back and forth. But basically, you have two enemies, one cannot get at the other. The British control the sea lanes, and they control the cities on the coast for the most part. The Americans control the interior of the country, the wilderness, the forests, the Appalachians, the Allegheny Mountains. They attack using guerrilla warfare against the English redcoats. <coughs> the English will send in Hessians, German fighters from Hess, who will be pretty ruthless. They'll be stationed in Germantown, Pennsylvania, now a suburb of Philadelphia. There'll be another 10,000 Hessians in there. They have no loyalty to Americans at all. They can't stand them. And therefore, they're not going to be sympathetic. Some of the British soldiers were sympathetic. So now you have the British holding the, the sea coast and the towns, Americans holding the Western territories. You can't, they cannot get at each other. Not very well. We fought another war like that in Vietnam. Vietnam, we, we control the cities. We can be a con control the interior. And how long, you can't fight a war like that for a long time without major, major issues. 
morale issues. Ultimately, the Americans have one advantage. Upstate New York, the British don't know it that way. Up the Hudson Valley. You have a large British army of close to 7,000 under General Johnny Bergoyne, B-E-R-G-O-Y-N-E. -E. Johnny Bergoyne was a composer, a music composer. But he's given a generalship under what? King George III, who says, I have a groovy job for you. How would you like to leave one of my red? Well, he's never fought much before. He writes music. <coughs> but like a lot of the gifts this king gives, he does it to solicit support. Because Burgoyne's got relatives in Parliament, they're Whigs, and he's going to win the family over to support the king's prerogatives. So he sends General Johnny Burgoyne. Johnny Burgoyne walked into the biggest trap ever set. Back in wasn't, it was so bad, it wasn't even a trap that was set. It's, it was a trap that we figured out how to set once he got in there. And that is, he got into the area around Saratoga, New York, heavily wooded, with a deep ravine, 7,000 troops. He gets surrounded and cut off, and pretty soon American lumbermen are coming in behind him, chopping trees down and blocking their, their exit from the area. They can't get out. It's October the 19th. 1777. They're surrounded. They're being picked off because the Americans won't fight fair. Behind trees, behind rocks, they won't stand. They're going to use Native American style fighting. They're not going to stand up row on row and face an organized British army. And the tactic works. Close to a thousand Brits are killed at Saratoga. Finally, Burgoyne knows he's totally stuck. He offers surrender at Saratoga. We take it, we celebrate, and we immediately send word across the Atlantic to Paris. We have defeated the British Army at Saratoga. 7,000, 6,000 that are left of troops have surrendered. We can win this war, and that's what now the French get and say, oh, sign me up. We're coming. And one of the first sign-ups was a guy that's going to last for the next 50 years. He keeps showing up in every every issue, and that's the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette, in fact, World War One, we went back and fought World War One against the Germans in, on French soil. That was our battle cry. Lafayette, we are here. It's, pay, it's payback. So the French now throw in. King signs off on this. This is King Louis. Starts with Louis the Fifteenth, winds up with Louis the Sixteenth, but Louis the Fifteenth signs on. Commit the French army, the French navy. French have the largest army in Europe, and they have a navy that's now superior to the British navy. What's wrong with the British navy? Well, it was very operable and well done in the last war, Seven Years' War. But since that time, the British had a brand new Lord of the Admiralty named Lord Sandwich. <laughs> and that's where we get the word sandwich. He's the first guy to be the first, but I don't know how you can prove this. But he's noted for always putting slices of meat and cheese between two pieces of bread and eating this. And this is the origin of the sandwich. I mean, seriously. It's during his prime ministership that we also had uh, the Sandwich Islands discovered. And you know which island it is. That's Hawaii today. Originally named after Lord Sandwich. Well, anyway, Lord Sandwich was a, not much of a taskmaster. Didn't, he was getting a lot of money for this job, Lord of the Admiralty. But at the same time, he left the, he left the Navy in total neglect. So the British ships were left neglected, rotting at harbor, not maintained well at all. Most of the naval personnel had checked out and said, forget this is a, this is a lousy racket. We're not taking care of the ships. So the British Navy is an all-time low as far as equipment, upkeep, and morale. 
And now you need the Navy because you've got to intercept the French. Well, the French have been recovering from the Seven Years' War, and now they've built a Navy that's absolutely superior to the British. And they send it in. And on numerous occasions, every time the British wanted to attack a French possession of the Caribbean, attack in India, or attack on the eastern coast, they were prevented so by the French. The French had better fleets, they had better naval personnel, and then the English Navy went through a very bad time, 1778, 79. Three major mutinies in the, in the English Navy during the Revolution. And one of the most notorious mutinies was against one of the most infamous commanders of any Navy at any time, Captain William Bly. Captain Bly, mutiny on the bounty, that wasn't his first mutiny. His first mutiny was during the American Revolution off the Spithead, off the southern coast of England, and the Nor, N-O-R, these are main battle lines. The British Navy had big squadrons there, and they mutinied. They refused to fight. Why? Fight against the French. They have better ships, they have better aim, they have better commanders, they don't neglect their ships, and we're just going to get killed. So they refused to take orders, they mutinied. So they hung a number of guys, but it didn't solve the problem. Lord Sandwich is going to have to step down. This whole thing, the major naval reform has to take place. There was a great movie about this. Not, it's a story that's built on that beauty uh, called Billy Budd. Has anybody ever seen Billy Budd? It's, it's just yeah. terrific. Okay. So much for movies that nobody remembers. All right, fine. Um, so now you got, and then now comes the League of Armed Neutrality. They jump in. Glad to do it. And then we have Spain jumps in. They're all in it. Spain wants the Gibraltar back. The League of Armed Neutrality wants all kinds of treaties renegotiated. They want to get their trade back. They want to get some land back. The French want to go after more land, get material in India, get the restoration of French Canada. So that everybody has an aim here. Now, as you do your reading in the English heritage, take a look at some of the, the very specifics, what everybody wants and why they're in this war. This war still, even with all that help, went pretty, it was, pretty, it was a grim struggle. Guerrilla warfare is not going to win the war, but it's going to, this war is going to go on forever. That was the thought. And finally, the French army was committed to fight the war. The French army was the biggest in Europe at the time. It had well over 100,000 troops, well armed, well fed, well trained well led by good generals. They came across on their bypassing British blockades, attempted blockade, on good French warships. They hit the area around New York, drove the British back up north. They helped, they helped the Americans in the colonies to the south, North and South Carolina. We won several significant victories with French help but then we had the chance to finally pull, pull off the big one. We had surrounded another army in the Carolinas. That army was being backed up into Virginia. So the British Army made it into, into Virginia and they were heading toward Yorktown, Virginia to get on board British ships to sail back to New York. The whole idea was a but it was the reverse of a counter the trap. The British had sent, were sending two armies down, one by land, one by sea, to come into Virginia, near Yorktown, to trap and encircle the American army. What the British didn't know is the French army had already landed. They were fighting along with us in the Yorktown Peninsula. <coughs> and the result was that the French general, Rochambeau, R-O-C-H-A-M, B-E-A-U. Look him up. He's in the book. The General Rochambeau agreed to fight under Washington's leadership to give Washington the credit. No jealousy. Just will do whatever they want. And Washington was sure this trap was being laid by the English in near Yorktown under General Corn Wallace. C-O-R-N. W-A-L-L-I-S. Cornwallis. Cornwallis.
Paul's a good general, career general. Not like Johnny Burgoyne. Not like the composer who's lost at Saratoga. But ironically, the date's almost the same as October of 1781. And the Americans have won a few, lost a few. There was seen to be no real whatever here. No, no sense of anybody's going to win soon. You'd already suffered the ravages of Valley Forge, a lot of American deaths, and everybody's wondering, is this war ever, ever, ever going to win? It would have gone on probably a lot longer, and we don't, I, I really cannot say what the outcome would have been, had it not been for French intervention. Now, I know Americans are really loath to give the French any credit for anything, especially helping to win the American Revolution. But they did step in. They were a big ally. They turned the tide. The professional army and the best artillery ever made in the world up to that time was the French artillery. Much better than England's artillery, much better than anybody's artillery. And they trained it on the English. So the English now prepared a defense outside of Yorktown, Virginia, on the Yorktown Peninsula, very close to where first colony was founded at Jamestown, Virginia. Yorktown had now become kind of a colonial capital, so to speak. English now surrounded this and they put bunkers up, supported it with all kinds of sentry posts, bunkers, and a, and a spread of fortifications around to defend it. The defenders went inside the fortifications at Yorktown had all their artillery. They had about 100 artillery pieces sticking out, aiming at all sides, and the Americans closed in around them. Once, however, you go into a defense area, defense mode, as the English did, with as many troops as they had, they had over 7,000 troops in this particular military operation. They had never lost, but at the same time, they had committed some atrocities. And the atrocities was to kill an entire regiment that had surrendered to the British. One British commander um, ordered the, the captains to be slaughtered. And when word of this reached the Americans, they said, no hold bars, we're going to catch these, we're going to kill these guys. Once we die. No hold bar. This is, this, this is now a different war. Um, so, they're surrounded, and the British know they're cut off. Cornwallis sends an urgent message to New York City, to the Commander-in-Chief, and says, look, get ships here now. We, we can't hold. We, we need to evacuate. And so the British Navy leaves New York Harbor and leaves Boston Harbor, and they move southward to go into the Chesapeake Bay into the peninsula, the wrong peninsula, at Yorktown, and rescue these troops. The word also reached the French commander, naval commander, who was operating in the Caribbean, intercept the British squadron. Don't let him in. And he got there in time, and he stopped the squadron, the British squadron, stopped the cold. They pulled on a run on the line, which you call ships of the line, all lined up, 20 ships. You have like 60 guns on each side of these ships. Here comes the British to break the blockade. British open fire, but the French have the advantage because they have both, mostly starboard side, pointing against the British as they come in. The British guns have, have to turn their ships to the side to face them, <coughs> to match them with the firepower. But by that time, the French have sunk close to half of the English ships. The English effort is, well, nobody knows what's going on. Cornwallis is waiting for a sign for the first sails to sail into the Chesapeake to get his men ready on board. He's got to get them out of here. No ships come in. They are turned back at the entry of the Chesapeake Bay by the French effort. This, it's over. And so October 1781, the 
French fleet defeats the British fleet at the entrance of the Chesapeake. Yorktown is completely cut off. Cornwallis's men are faced with, now that the, now the French and the Americans have broken into the interior lines, and they've got all their guns aimed into the city of Yorktown, where the British are held up, and just begin to blow the shit up. That's what they're, they're just blowing the crap out of the town. It's still there. You go to Yorktown today, you can still see where the fog marks are, where the, where the, where the uh, American and French guns hit the city. All the walls are still being damaged there. Just, they left it. And it's really a great historic site. Uh, so they're there. They're stuck. They can't get out. Cornwallis knows he's had it. There's no rescue. Ships didn't come. Any, war, any, any orders of surrender. Will, and he wants to surrender, not to Washington, I mean, that's bad enough. But to surrender to General Rochambeau, the French, the French commander, after all, that's one civilized group to another. Not Washington and these colonial assholes. So they're not going to, he refuses. Rochambeau sends word, I will, not I will not take your surrender. You will surrender to Washington or maybe to one of Washington's aides. Mm -hmm. So it's, everybody's lowering the, the expectations. Rochambeau finally, along with Washington, meet with Cornwallis at Yorktown. Cornwallis gives him a sword. It's over. And then in a, in a gesture unlike the usual surrender, during the usual surrender, those who surrender are allowed to march to fife and drum, carrying their weapons with them as they march into captivity or as they march into surrender, and usually they're repatriated to go back home, return to England or return to France or wherever. But because of the incident near the Cowpens in the Carolinas, where those troops had been, the American troops had been massacred by one English colonel. They decided not to do this. What they decided to do was take the surrender, but make the British throw down all of their weapons in humiliation, throw down your flag, throw down the Union Jack, throw down all of the military flags for all of the regiments, put down your swords, put down your pistols, throw down your guns. And as they marched, they marched to the sound of an old melody called The World Turned Upside Down. It's a little thing they used to sing. It's, it sounds a little bit like Yankee Doodle, but it wasn't. World Turned Upside Down. Because to them, their world, this was an upside down world. This didn't happen. The most powerful nation on the earth surrendering to its own colonials and to the French. they did. It's, it, it was unbelievable. This shit. And it happened after <coughs> how many years of fighting, folks? 1775 to 1781. Roughly six to seven years of fighting. How many deaths? We really don't know. We really don't know the number. Total humiliation of the British. Two of their major officers losing, surrendering, humiliated. The British are now in a jam that they're going to have to find a way out of. Because not only are they fighting the Americans, they are fighting all over the globe. They're fighting the French in India. They're fighting the French in Canada. They're fighting the French in the Caribbean. They're fighting the Spanish near Gibraltar, attacking Gibraltar constantly to get that back. And they're fighting the League of Armed Neutrality. They're very neutral. Spread throughout the world. Yeah, they're not that neutral. Because they all hate the British. Britain needs to get out of this war. This is the worst war they ever fought. They've got to get out of it. The only way they can get out of it, possibly, 
is to separate the Americans from their allies to get them to sign a separate treaty. And if they do that, then the allies will no longer have a reason to fight. The British government is divided. The government that started this war against the Americans, the government of Lord North and King George III, are totally discredited. Lord North is told to step down. The British Parliament is humiliated. They say, how the hell can we have gotten drunk into this thing? I remember asking a good colleague of mine, who used to teach here on visitation from uh, Winchester University, English, very English. And I talked to him about the, the traumatic impact of the, the loss of the American colonies on the British. And he says, Yeah, yeah. There was no impact. <laughs> Did, didn't mean anything. He said, Roger, you're full of shit. <laughs> uh, it did mean a lot. Uh, this was just an unbelievable scenario. How do you get out of this mess? So, what we're going to deal with on Wednesday are the surrender terms how the British find a way out of the mess with one of the slickest treaties ever devised. It's called the Treaty of 1783. The fighting still continues after 81, but officially they're, they're trying to find a way through this and what, how the British pull this off. So we'll see you Wednesday.